Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm glad you're here today, and I'm glad this is t you welcome you to this all-female panel, which is a little girl power on a Sunday afternoon. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, uh, first of all, we're just going to go through each of the films and show you a little clip and just introduce the characters as we will come to discuss later. So we're going to start first with uh, Care to Laugh, and this is director Julie Getz. So Julie, why don't you just tell us first how you came to find Jesus? I know you live on the East Coast, and he is a comic from Long Beach. How did that happen? Sure, I'm going to keep introductions brief, right? Yeah, this first I mean, intro? Yeah, why okay. you brief? yeah, you can introduce. Sure, so we first... Yeah. So um, we... First of all, thanks everyone for coming out today. Um, and uh, so we first met Jesus uh, in December 2016. So for you guys to know, uh, I'm the director of Care to Laugh, this film, but I'm also the director of development for AARP Studios. I'm in charge of TV, film, and podcast. And um, in December 2016, the organization ran a study on what do caregivers, which is a core topic that we are committed to raising awareness of, um, what do they need most? And it was time and laughter. So we decided to four wall event at the Hollywood Improv in Los Angeles. We decided, and we invited all caregivers, and then we lined it up with headliner Jim Brewer from Saturday Night Live, and we brought in some opening comics, um, preferably ones that had, their material was, was about family. And we met Jesus that night, again, as an opening comic, and um, opening event, or opening act, sorry. And he, we fell in love with him immediately. He's just this extraordinary human being. Fast forward four months, we decided to replicate what we had just done in Los Angeles to New York, and we call him up, and I said, hey, Seuss, uh, we, want, we want you to come out to New York and do this again, and he was like, look, you guys, my dad's really sick. I'm at this fork in the road in my life where I'm now, I can't do auditions, I'm scaling back on my, you know, my comedy, going out, and uh, I'm picking up more of the family's business, which is cutting grass. And we looked at that as this, this is a story, and we asked uh, if we could follow him and share his story, and he had never done this before. His parents had never done anything like this before, and so for 12 months, we followed him, and what you see is, and what you'll see on Wednesday uh, at 5.15 here <laughs> is the movie. What happened? That was a long intro. I'm no, sorry. that was fine. That was great. Um, next, we have Sabrina Gordon, and uh, she is the producer of Quest, which was a film that made a big splash last year. And we're going to show a clip to start, and then Sabrina will introduce herself. Hi, welcome. Hi, hi. Um, what do you want uh, to just, What part of the introduction? I think maybe just tell us a little bit about you and your involvement with the film, and how what your past, how you brought brought you to this uh, sure. point. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Because right. there's so much I could talk about, of like course. already. So, um, yeah. So my name is Sabrina Street Gordon. I'm the producer of the film. The way I came to it. Uh, well, let me start by saying that the film was shot for over 10 years. And it began actually as a photography project. It wasn't even going to be a film. And it's made by uh, the director's Jonathan Olszewski, who was a first time filmmaker. And long story short, he was looking for someone to help him make the film because he hadn't made a film before. And a mutual filmmaker friend of ours uh, introduced us. And I don't know how much we're going to talk about it later, but you know, I had some questions and reservations, frankly, about getting involved. And we Long story short, we worked those out, and um, that's how we ended up working together. I came in maybe a few years before he we finished um, filming, and the film's arc is sort of from the uh, first election of Barack Obama through the ascendancy of Donald Trump in 2016. We weren't sure how we were going to end the film, but as we were filming in 2016, we we're like, I think this is feels where like we an end. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's the short version. Great, thank you. I love how di how diverse these films are. It's really a, it's a terrific panel and. These are my favorite kinds of movies, too. Um, OK, next we have Karen Winter. And her film, Exit, as we mentioned, is going to premiere or screen here uh, 15 minutes after this panel. And um, the, the first two of you are not in your films. But the second two, um, Sabrina and Ashley, are both in, have both chosen to be in your films. And we'll talk about that afterwards as well. I'm, no, I'm sorry, Karen and, Karen and Ashley. So this is Karen Winter, and this is Exit. So Karen is joining us from Norway, and she has um, the film goes into a much uh, different story about her own background. But I'll let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you came to make Exit. Hi, thank you everybody for coming. Um, yeah, I I wanted to make a film about former extremists and how they managed to leave, like because there was a lot of discussion at the time um, around 2013 about radicalization and why people join extremist movements. Um, 
And uh, for me as a filmmaker and also as a person who has some experience from my teenage years with extremist groups, um, I thought, I mean, why is there not more discussion about the reasons why people live? Like, what is it that can make people have a complete change in their life? So, and I really wanted to find, um, have a, a character from the US and I really wanted to have um, a female um, former um, because I think that we haven't really heard that many stories about you know women who were very violent and very extreme uh, and to hear their stories about um, how they managed to leave that movement um, so I so I started looking at it and then I came across this clip on YouTube of Angela just talking about her background and I immediately felt that there was something about her that I, I just knew that she could be really powerful voice in the film. And so I just, uh, I mean, in Europe, I really struggled to find people who would agree to be in front of the camera. And um, so I don't know if there's a, this is a cultural difference, but with Angela, I just, I, I found her on Facebook and sent her a message and explained what the film was about. And she just said, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> So, yeah, so we immediately made a connection. That might be a whole different conversation about why Americans are. Sure, I'll be on, I'll be on, <laughs> on the screen. Great, thank you. And this is Ashley York, and she's the director of Hillbilly, and um, she's going to show you a little bit about, uh, we'll, we'll look at her clip, but she went back to her hometown in Kentucky uh, to kind of explore the differences that she was seeing um, within the American public. Is that good? Okay, and this is Hillbilly. Ashley? Oh, well, thanks everybody for, for being here. Um, so Hillbilly is a film that I think it, it was meant for me to make this film. I have memories going back to being seven and eight years old and seeing rural folks and Appalachian people specifically being featured in popular media, specifically the um, news, like the, those primetime news channels. So, you know, it's something that has been part of my life for as long as I can remember, and something that I, you know, have worked so hard to separate myself from. And I think it's inspired my career in media making, and I teach also at USC. So this film came to be, we started making it five years ago, and the intention was to examine media portrayals of Appalachia and mountain people and the rural experience with the intention of expanding cultural understanding. So that was the beginning of a very long journey where we got to intersect with so many incredible people. I mean, my um, heroes like Bell Hooks and Frank X. Walker and Silas House and my grandmother Shelby are all featured in this film. Uh, I am also in the film. There's a little brief clip of me in front of that coal pile. Um, but that was certainly not my intention to be um, a subject in the film. It just was something that evolved as time went on in the making of the movie. So um, it can be so effective to use personal stories to illustrate larger issues in our culture, and that's what I think each of you has done so well. Um, can you talk about what the what your goal was when you started and how it changed. I mean, some of you, your movie was over 10 years of time and five years of time, and I don't know how long the other two of you, the, yours was quite quick, I think, Julie, right? One, one year you filmed with him. Um, so Julie's talked a little bit already about how this movie came about in order to, you wanted to illustrate certain issues. Um, can you tell us about how you think that, that that works in film, where you take, an, you know, what's an ordinary person and, elevate them, how do you make them into a character, into a, into a movie star, you know, without, um, how do you do that? How do you make them comfortable with the camera? How do you make them um, happy to tell their story and share it with you, but also with your other go potential goals in mind? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say right off the bat that I feel like we got really, really lucky with meeting Jesus. Um, he is just, kind of we were talking about earlier, he's a likable person, and he's an extraordinary, he's an extraordinary person. He is. He's a millennial, he's an only child, and he's caring for his aging parents. And he, 
he just has grit and he never takes his foot off the accelerator while he's trying to pursue this career in stand-up comedy, which is incredibly hard, incredibly difficult. It's late, late nights um, while coming back home and taking his parents to the doctors to uh, picking up pills at the prescription, you know, the pharmacy. It's like, it's never, it's just always continuous with him. Um, how to get him and his parents to open up to the cameras. Obviously, as a filmmaker, it's, it's trust, right? It's, it's breaking it down, and you become really close, and you become friends, and, you know, you ask Jesus that same question. He always says, like, we became members of his family over the years, you know, over the year. And I think that's, that's vital, and it's about creating space for physical space, you know, the, the, spirit, the mental and physical space of being able to allow us to film and, and for him to be... Uh, to open up and be vulnerable, right? Because he's, he's, they're being incredibly vulnerable in our film and, and, and showing us, which you guys haven't seen yet. But, um, and you see those, you see those moments. Um, and then I guess the early part of your question is that, you know, this film was, you know, there's 40 million unpaid family caregivers in this country. And Jesus is just one of these stories. And he never asks to get paid. He never gets, never asks for any sort of recognition. It's just what he does. You know, they come from the Hispanic Latino culture where this is this is it. This is what we do for our family, and it's just a strong message for millennials, for caregivers, um, that you know these are these are real stories that are out there, and that to let them know that they're not alone, and this to bring light and to bring levity into sometimes an often dark subject, uh, and that was the purpose and. We hope that, especially for any project that I work on, I want people to learn something new, maybe shock you a little bit, um, and to walk away from the theater and just feeling like, again, that you've somehow been engaged or inspired. Um, Sabrina, how did, how did the director find the Rainies in the first place, and, and what was he setting out to do? And then when you came on board, did that shift? Was he asking you to help kind of shape the film? Sure. The story? Sure. So, um, I mean, for them, in terms of opening up, I mean, it was a very gradual process. And I think, frankly, they didn't even know. I don't think anyone then knew that there was a film being made. Um, and, you know, we, we premiered at Sundance in uh, 2017. And so we did the festival circuit for a year. And we took the family with us as much as we could. And invariably, they would talk, they would refer to the film as like they thought it was just like some home movies. They thought they were helping John with his homework because he was at Temple. Um, and, um, so for them, it wasn't, you know, they were never really thinking in this sort of self-conscious, like, you know, self-conscious way uh, by, um, about how they would be, pre uh, how they were presenting in the film. What I did notice as a, the person who came in later, when I looked at the material, and it had a lot to do with why I decided to get involved, is that, you know, you see from the beginning that you feel like it's a little bit performative, because they're trying to give... John maybe what they think he needs or wants, but over time, because John spent so much time with them, that it became clear that this wasn't a case of um, a white filmmaker, this is a sort of parachuting in and out of their lives, but he had really spent time and cultivated a very close and intimate um, relationship with them that you see um, re uh, reflected in the film. Um, to answer your question about how they met, um, John happened to be teaching a photography class and met Quest's brother. And he said that, um, oh, my brother has like this music studio in his basement. Why don't you come check it out? And Jonathan being Jonathan was like, yeah, okay. And he went and he was actually there just to take pictures of the artists. And it was gonna be like maybe a promo for like their CD or something like that. And um, John was working in construction and doing photography and he was really fascinated um, by Quest, who was doing this music and, and raising his family and doing his paper route. And so I think they started, they kind of bonded around about like how to create art and meet, you know, sustain your family and things like that. And, you know, it just went from there. When, um, in terms of my involvement, I, you know, I alluded to the fact that I had some reservations and it reminds me a little bit about your film, is that when Jonathan first came to me and I saw, okay, this is about a film about black folks and we're talking about um, economic insecurity and we're talking about hip hop and then we're talking about um, gun violence and all of these things that I feel like if it's not really handled properly or if you don't have the material for it, it can really reinscribe sort of stereotypes about black life, particularly urban black life, particularly the most vulnerable um, folks you know, among us. And I was very hesitant to, to participate in that. But what I came to find is that, A, when I looked at the material, is that it actually presented um, another opportunity that you know, clearly all that time he spent 
was not so much about like he documented 2007, 2008, 2009, but what happened over time is he developed this really intimate relationship and he was able to get material that just would not have been possible without that kind of investment. And so I found, when I watched it, I felt like, oh, there's so much more to this than this music studio. And this is a, actually an opportunity to disrupt a lot of the narratives about uh, about black life and specifically about communities like North Philly and others like them around the uh, around the country that you know and when we talked about sort of the approach to the film you know I talked about my reservations and and we and he was on, we were on the same page and he was open to it if you hadn't been I probably wouldn't have um, participated um, but I said what we have to do is we really have to people are going to come to this story thinking that they know who these people are that they know what this story is that they know you know because they've you know, you know their only interaction with it is largely like news and whatever you see on TV so we have to be mindful that we are constantly like we're you know it's truth to power like we're telling you know the story as it is but we're constantly disrupting what you think this community is about, what this family is about, how people navigate the challenges that they face in their lives is about. So that was like my, my sort of, um, I was very transparent about like, this is an opportunity to have a different kind of conversation. And, um, and a way in which to change conversations around gun violence, around poverty, around all of these things. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's how I came to it. And really, the <laughs> microcosm of their story just opened up into so many issues over when you spend 10 years with a family, things emerge and it was so it, it was really beautifully done, I thought. Right, no, thank you. And I, and I would say too, in terms of like, you know, we've been show, you know, the film premiered, um, as I said, at Sundance, we did a theatrical run at the end of, the, about a year ago, almost to the day, and then we premiered on POV in, um, uh, in June, on Father's Day, which was really nice that they, they um, gave us the opening, um, uh, we opened the, the season, and what we've been doing since then is doing like a, a lot of engagement, and the opportunity I feel like the film presents is exactly what you said, that it's not really about any particular issue, but it's the way, it's about how all these different issues that we talk about intersect in people's lives, and how people actually navigate them. So it's an opportunity to talk about all of these um, different things, and look at them from the perspective of the people who are actually living them, as opposed to like sort of the outside in about like what, what do we think. Statistics and numbers yeah. and those kind of things. Yeah, so. don't tell the story. Yeah. Thanks, um, Karen. Why don't you talk a little bit? Tell a little bit about. Um, you already kind of explained your own experience, but then you went around and you interviewed these kind of seminal figures in the what you call the formers um, <coughs> community. Can you talk about what that was like? Because in some cases, your subjects were in hiding or were in kind of dangerous positions. Um, can you talk about what that was like for you? Uh, yeah, we had to, I mean, I mean, my cinematographer and I, we were laughing because it's like, okay, so what, what can we actually shoot? How do we shoot this film? Because they're, we're dealing with people who, for security reasons, uh, they would agree to be in the film and be interviewed, but there's like, as long as you don't show where I live, my family, my workplace, <laughs> <laughs> or anything that can, you know, reveal to people information about me that could, you know, put me in danger. So you're like, okay, so what's left? <laughs> so we, um, uh, and and of course, it's very important to build trust. And I, I remember uh, during research, I visited uh, the exit uh, Sweden and their office in Stockholm. And um, one of the social workers there told me very early on that in her experience, a lot of former extremists uh, have been to prison and have had that mentality um, and that they have this like very black and white thinking even after they leave and she said like if you if you give a promise then you have to keep your promise like if you break a promise then they will never trust you again like even the little details like if you agree to meet like make sure that you never promise anything that you don't know for sure that you can keep so I I always kept that in mind and and I told them from the very beginning that I mean I'm making a film and of course I want people to see that there's a way out of extremism and and show them uh, this topic from a different perspective and and I'm not interested in revealing anything about you that can put you in danger or and I don't want you to give me information about former friends that you had or specific groups or anything like that I just want to get it into the, the personal motivation, the personal experience, and see if there's a pattern between 
these you know people from with different backgrounds and um so I think that helped people to ease up a little bit and uh um but we had to do all kinds of things like uh, you know renting Airbnb apartments and do the interviews there and 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 like we will film something that's kind of representative of the type of place that person might live, but it's not in the neighborhood where that person live because most of the time I didn't really know where they lived <laughs> so were you able did you meet with any resistance were there any interviews that you couldn't Secure because you they they weren't they weren't willing or they weren't able to. Participate. Well, I met with lots of uh, people during research that um, had really interesting, powerful stories, but they just weren't comfortable being in front of a camera and exposing themselves in that way. And um, and I also I had one female former that I really wanted to have in the film, but she kept going back and forth. I had this like ambivalence in her. So at some point, I just had to tell her that, look, I mean, if you're not sure, then I think it's better that you don't do it because it will just be, you know, very difficult if all of a sudden you <laughs> decide the, after we cut the film or something that, you know, it's just going to be too difficult. And there was one at early rec like development stage, we had a really powerful interview with a former, and then he pulled out, and uh, I mean. <coughs> If anyone, if you tried financing a film, it's like, you know, you just lost the best, the strongest character. And I mean, that feeling, we're like, we're like, okay, let's just keep going. And um, then we found, you know, other stories that were just as powerful or more powerful. So you just have to keep believing in what you're doing. But it was uh, quite a long journey. I know documentary filmmakers live for those kind of happy accidents, right? You try to trust the, <laughs> trust the process. Great, thanks. Um, Ashley, why don't you, this is interesting that you said that you didn't set out to be in your film, so maybe tell us a little bit about how you came to be in your film. Right. Or whatever you'd like to talk about. Right. Um, well, we, when we started making this film, you know, as I said, it was an exploration of media representations of Appalachia and Appalachian American people going back to the late 1800s. So we did a lot of archival research. I spent a ton of time looking at media clips, gathering media clips. And then we essentially built this whole movie that showed the progression of all of these media representations over a 100-year period. And it was just so difficult to sit with that movie, to watch that movie, to see these stereotypes be perpetuated, if you will, over and over and over again, decade after decade. So you know, at that point, we started asking ourselves, what is Appalachia? Who lives there? Like, what are we trying to do? So that's what led the us real to... real-life counterparts, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and that's what led us to deepening the storytelling with Silas House and Bell Hooks. You know, people who we had interviewed, you know, who were scholarly and who were talking about what these representations mean culturally and politically and socially. And then when we decided to take that a step deeper, that's when the movie really opened up, you know, and we got to spend time, you know, hanging out with people in their lives, you know, making, whether that's like making pinto beans or like writing their work or performing at a rock concert. And, you know, it just really expanded the perspective of the film and led us to the Afro-Latin Poets Group, which is a group of African-American poets, uh, which was founded by Frank X. Walker. And we were invited in to film a scene with them. We filmed with some young Fabulachians, which is this queer identified group of folks who play music and write poems and, you know, do all sorts of, of fun things. We um, filmed with this group of young filmmakers at the Appalachian Media Institute throughout a summer when they were making social issue films. Um, the one that we feature in the film is about uh, Black Lives Matter. So, you know, it was really invigorating to be able to elevate these stories and to really subvert these stereotypes that were really um, inspiring us to make this film. So, and then my own, uh, uh, appearance in the film came in the next phase when we had all of these great elements and all of these cinema verite portraits and all of these really incredible scholars who were, you know, thinking about these issues in such complex and nuanced ways, but there was no narrative 
through line that was holding it all together. So that's where I came in and, you know, very reluctantly, I mean, to this day, you know, it's still a process of, you know, watching the film and accepting myself as a subject in it. I mean, that is not who I am as a person. Like, oh, let me make a movie and put myself in it. Like, that is just not, you know, what I wanted to do. Um, you know, but for the purposes of the storytelling and, you know, deepening the narrative and trying to put a personal perspective to a very complicated topic, you know, I was willing to do it. And the election, the 2016 presidential election, also happened during the making of the film. And, you know, that started to, to surface while we were filming with the young filmmakers. And I started asking people, um, you know, about the election. And, you know, of course, I thought the end of this movie was going to be us all square dancing, you know, me and Bell Hooks and Silas House and Hillary Clinton's the 45th president <laughs> of the United <laughs> States. And, you know, like, that's what I thought the ending was. And I, you know, of course, couldn't have been more incorrect about, um, you know, what ultimately happened. But the... Um, you know, we decided to put my family in the film as part of the election coverage, and that just organically put me in some of the scenes. And when we showed that to people, and when we started having some work in progress screenings, people were just really moved by the fact that, you know, I grew up in this place, this very rural place. I've lived in Los Angeles for 16 years and, you know, have a deep understanding and appreciation of both of those worlds, the rural and the urban. So, um, you know, there's a lot in the movie. A lot I, in the movie. I watched it four days ago or so, and I've been talking about Grandma Shelby ever since. Granny so. Shelby, yeah. yeah. Granny Shelby. She has fans all over mm -hmm. this country. Mm -hmm. um, great. I think we have, we're going to go into Q&A in just a few minutes, but um, I have some questions that I came up with. I love, Julie, the, the part, there's a line at the end of your film that says, it's on the screen that says that no matter who you are, at some point in your life, you will be a caregiver or need care, right? Need one, right? Um, what do you want audiences to, to take away from your film? Is that, is that it? I mean, is that the message? Or how do, how, how do you hope this movie plays out and with audiences? Sure. Um, well, kind of what I was saying earlier is that after you watch the film, that you've learned something, that, um, that hopefully we've somehow changed or shifted your perception of what a caregiver looks like or what he or she does. Um, and that, you know, Jesus, again, is one of 40 million stories that are out there in our country. And uh, again, if you may be a caregiver yourself right now, or you may know of somebody, and hopefully you understand um, what kind of what goes into it, and you would maybe pick up the phone or help them out a little bit, um, because ultimately you will be in those shoes. You will either be cared for or be taking care of some, somebody. So, and again, it, you know, working for AARP, the largest the country's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, it's one of the reasons why we made this film was to change the conversation on, uh, you know, getting out there and, and, and creating content for caregiving and caregivers. You know, a lot of people don't know, oh, AARP, you guys are an insurance company or you guys are, no, we are a huge organization with lots of issues that we care about and looking to raise awareness on. So, and caregiving is one of those. And I mean, Jesus couldn't have been a, Again, we got lucky. He's just an incredible human being, and he allowed us into into his lives. And we hope that you guys are that people are inspired. Um, Sabrina, your film's been out in the world, as you said, for a while, and it's been on POV. Where can people see it now? And also, what has the response been from audiences, and what kinds of impact do you think the film has had? Yeah, so um, it's available on iTunes. And um, you can get it for schools and organizations. And um, our, uh, you can go to our website. It's quest-documentary.com. And we have all that information about how you can access the, um, access the film. Um, in terms of how the audiences have responded, I mean, as you can imagine, you know, everyone falls in love with the family. And um, it's very interesting that you know, sometimes you know, when we're on the festival uh, circuit, we were showing the film mostly to um, frankly, like um, white audiences and frankly, uh, privileged white audiences who have the luxury to, uh, to go to Sundance and spend two weeks there and all these other um, festivals. And of course, you know, they, you know, they respond very, you know, uh, warmly to them. They want to do something to help the family or help the community. And, and uh, what, one of the things that um, 
folks would say to me often is, oh, you have to show this to more white people, you know, as if, you know, to suggest that basically, like, you know, white folks will get a, a better and more maybe nuanced understanding of folks that maybe they have only interacted with, again, like through sort of like the evening news or whatever, like reductive narrative that they've been exposed to. And that's all well and good, but I thought it was interesting too that for me, that um, while that's obviously part of, of what you're doing when you're you know, sort of like disrupting uh, narratives, but for me, I felt like this is an opportunity to do a couple of things, and one of them is, you know, as a woman of color, and always having like this dissonance, like for myself, like I, there's how I understand myself to be, and there's sort of like the portrayal of people that look like me that always had a certain kind of dissonance. And I was like, what can I do to sort of like close that gap in some way, and, and make a film that black folks will see, whether they ha uh, have a background similar to the Rainies or their upper middle class or whatever. Like my background is not, a, I'm like first generation. I'm, I have a, a, a very different experience than they, than they do. But like when you, we watch it, regardless of that, like I see these folks and I'm like, I recognize them. Like I, I, I know who they are, as opposed to what we often feel is like, well, that's, not, I, I don't, yeah, it just doesn't seem to kind of fit, and you just kind of always have to accept this certain level of um, dissonance, and you just take that for granted, that that's just how it's going to be. Um, I think in terms of like the impact, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things. One of them is what I just described, and um, you know, I used to make this joke with Jonathan, I was like, look, I have to get this right because no one's coming after you. <laughs> Black folks are coming after you if this is wrong. So, I, you know, so you know, there would be things where, like, I would feel very strongly that we have to frame them in certain ways and and have the story um, unfold in certain ways because we have to keep remembering that people are coming to this with, lo you know, their. Um, um, the images are loaded, it's just too low, the issues are too loaded for us to just take for granted that like people are just going to fall in love and appreciate their humanity and all of these different kinds of things. And you know, so we even had like a different um, uh, cut at one point that I felt like we're, we're, we're not like framing this in a way that people can really engage, um, okay, I thought someone was talking to me, um, um, uh, engage folks in the nuance and complexity and beauty of, you know, of, of this story. Um, I also wanted to think, you know, I was also thinking about Black Lives Matter, interestingly enough, um, and people often talking, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the country, and people, you know, let's say something happened to someone, they would say, well, this person was a straight-A student, they come from a middle-class family, and so on and so forth, or if this person was, like, was not a straight-A student, all of a sudden there was, like, this weird kind of, like, respectability thing around who deserves, you know, compassion and who doesn't, and I felt like, you know, this is the story that we need to tell that, um, that again really challenges this I, I, this idea about who we think is worthy, and also I was thinking too about like what we think the American experience is, and there's a way in which like the uh, idea of the American experience is one th looks one way, and everyone else is like sort of like on the margins, you know, somewhere. And it's like how do we center the experience of the Rainey family? So this is the Ameri the story of American life. This is the American experience. This is an American family, and that's not about ignoring race so much as it is really really trying to center that experience. Um, and the last thing I would, um, and, and have it defined as an American one and not just like there's this American thing and there's like something else somewhere else, you know, whatever. And then finally I would say in terms of um, um, impact, because it's again, as I was saying before, it's a story of a family and you see all these different issues intersect in their lives, it presented actually an opportunity, it does present an opportunity to like address gun violence in new ways, change a conversation around gun violence, talk a, change a conversation around um, civic engagement and economic empowerment and, and trauma is a big theme in the film and I think that's something like people talk about like what's wrong with this community when you know things like this happen but no one talks about healing, nobody talks about trauma, no one talks about how people manage you know these experiences so healing from trauma and especially through art because I think the, the studio um, the music studio um, plays that part in the community that it's a, a healing space for a lot of people so those are all the ways and so much more I think that the film can do and I try to leverage as the film as a tool as much as powerful to make a really measurable impact in people's lives um, because I think that's the least that we owe the family for sharing so much of their lives with the world really um, I think we're going to go and have some questions from the audience, and I'll, I'll make sure to get you two back in so I don't... Sorry if I talk too long. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions? If not, I have some more. I'm just curious if anyone here... Yes. Did 
Did you all hear that? Yeah. Uh, or do I hear? Okay. Re repeat it. Um, she she's actually, asking about Karen's own personal experience with personal with um, radical extremism, which she mentioned, and we'll ha have her go into it a little more. Um, yeah, I joined the radical left wing movement when I was 15, and then I was uh, moved into the far right movement, and was there for a little while, and then left when I was 17. So that was back in '96. So now you know how old I am. Um, yeah, so it was a very intense and sh short period of my life, but um, yeah, it had quite big consequences. And uh, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Like, you know, why did all that happen? And why did I? Um, and of course, that is a very important reason why I'm interested in finding out what is it that can make people in those kind of movements change. Because, yeah, I think that's interesting that some people can change. And we're hopeful that people in, in lots of different areas could see the film in terms of government needs, um, social worker needs, psych psychological needs, right? I mean, it would be interesting to see like what kind of impact this film could have. Well, we, I mean, because I, I didn't have all these like impact goals. I just, personally, I was really curious to find out. So what was it that happened? But then because I'm, I think I'm much better at asking questions and exploring something that I feel passionate about than thinking about all those kind of goals. But then, of course, uh, working with my producer and, and applying for funding, then we had to make all these like impact strategies and things like that. Um, and then we started thinking about more how can we use the film. And now we've actually we've had two screenings in, in um, high-security prisons in Norway. And that was really interesting, got some very honest response from some of the inmates. And um, yeah, and we had, and we started also screening it to uh, yeah, politicians and social workers. And it's, um, it's really a lot of people who are interested in screening it now. In, and um, so I hope that it can be used for all kinds of you know, CV work. Um, does anyone have a question for Ashley so we can just kind of round this out? We have about five minutes left. Uh, I have one for Sabrina. You have one for Sabrina? Yeah. Can I just do one for Ashley really fast and then yeah. we'll come back to you? Thanks. Um, so Ashley, one thing that you talked about was um, you're, you really have this powerful um, comparison between the way that films are, um, that, that the hillbilly, hillbilly Appalachian people are portrayed in, in media um, versus what they're really like. And I just, one of the lines that really struck me was when you talked about Barbara Koppel's film, Harlan County, USA, and how that was a major influence for you because it was the first time that, you can tell, why don't you tell how that influenced you? Do you folks know Harlan County, USA? The great Harlan County, USA, of course, yes. Um, so Harlan County, USA is a film um, by Barbara Koppel, it won the Academy Award in 1976. This is a film that I saw when I was 19 years old in a college class at the University of Kentucky. It was a sociology class where, you know, it was back in the day when they would roll the TV in and it had the VHS deck and they put the VHS in. And, you know, I think it was like the first documentary I ever saw or that I was like conscious that this was a documentary and I was just so riveted by this film and by the way that it represented this community in southeast Kentucky it's about a coal strike as many of you know um, and it just really moved me and I think really um, you know showed me that media can be critical it can be complex it can be um, you know it can break all of the conventions of television news which you know at that time in you know this was in 1999 I was nine, um, 19 years old um, you know, that was pretty much all I had had exposure to was these NBC news programs and television news. So, you know, it was just really pivotal for me. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily in that moment that I was like, oh, I want to make documentary films because I was still learning um, as, a, as a journalist and I was still in the newspaper and the television and the radio world. But it did catapult me for sure into um, an interest in a more cinematic exploration of journalism, and then ultimately cinema school. I, that's why I moved to Los Angeles, was to go to USC and to do a master's in the School of Cinematic Arts. All due to Barbara Koppel. All right. due to good, the great Barbara Koppel. Perfect. I mean, can we just recognize yeah. the great Barbara Koppel for one, one moment? 
Um, She's my hero. I actually saw her at the opening night party the other night, and I'd watched her film, and I told her that it was Oh, in, did in you? There. Yeah. Thanks. Was, yeah, that's true. Um, so why don't you just go down? We'll come back to your question for Serena. We're just, I just want to make sure everyone gets to say when their films are screening here, if applicable. So why don't you start, Ashley? Tell us when Hillbilly. When we screen tomorrow night at IFC 2 at 7.45. Yeah, we're screening just right out this panel, so it's wander five. on over. Yeah. Yeah, so you have just have time for a quick break and then just go to the screening. Five o'clock. Yep. You can see my film on iTunes or go to our website and get in touch with us. Or arrange a community screening. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And Care to Laugh screens on Wednesday at five fifteen here, and then on Thursday at twelve forty five at IFC. Great. Do we have time for one? We have time for one. Okay, great. So can't really see you, but you had a question for Sabrina. Yeah. Uh, so, Sabrina, I was wondering, what was it about the, uh, the Rainey family's actions in their community that, that helped you believe that uh, they were the right cornerstone for the disruptive conversation? It was what about the Rainies in their community that helped you think they were the, they were the right disruptive force for a conversation in the community? Um, I mean, I think it was it was a couple of things. Um, in terms of like who they are and you know the subject of this pan the top the heading of this pan the the name of this panel is like ordinary subjects extraordinary people uh, yeah, yeah. yeah some yeah. sorry it was some, yeah. <laughs> but you get the idea and and I think that's that that they embody both of those things is really what I thought um, made you know when I was watching the material again I said you know this is like the story that can really like really had changed conversations around a lot of things because on one hand they are really like like an ordinary family I love the scene for example where um, PJ and Quest is walking his daughter to school and she they, they're talking about the election and then she sort of segues into like trying to negotiate um, um, bargain around her curfew and you see the minute she's, he st she starts to sort of angle like to get her curfew like sort of change her father's kind of rolling his eyes or whatever and I'm like that's something that's just so like typical parent adolescent you know uh, uh, moment that happens so organically um, at, you know there but at the same time I mean it takes really I think extraordinary people to be so committed to their community in the way that they are um, that they in the uh, this is not in the film but you know Quest told me a story that I think a record center had closed in North Philly around the time that he opened up his doors and he just saw that kids were hanging out on the street corners again and he just opened his doors and said you know they were all interested in rap music and stuff like that and he said well I have a studio come you can I'll record you and and so on and that's how um, um, uh, that space became like a community oh, sorry, an unofficial um, community space and um, uh, there was something else I, was, I wanted to say uh, about that space that uh, I don't know how much, have people seen the film? Have many of you? So a lot of people see the film. I don't want to ruin every, anything for anyone who's gonna, still gonna like see the film, but there's, there's something that happens that you would think that after this happens, he would just shut down his doors and he chooses not to. It's really, and that to me is like so extraordinary and that speaks to his commitment and love for his, his, his neighborhood, his family, his like, you know, his, the life that he shares with, um, um, the community. many documentaries about famous people mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you got if you like what can you say about the reception of the landscape to a films about people who aren't famous um, the question is just about how uh, about how um, films about ordinary Americans are received in contrast to a lot of the bigger biopics that have about famous okay. people with respect to distribution mm, with respect to distribution yeah I mean, it's been more of a challenge, for sure. I mean, my first film is Tig, which is about Tig Notaro, and that's a film that we premiered at Sundance in 2015, and um, right after the premiere, Lisa Nishimura walked up and gave me her card and said, I want your movie. Um, you know, we have not had the same response for um, Hillbilly, although we do have a distributor, but it's a much different sort of 
response. So I think that, um, you know, it's definitely a different experience from my point of view. Um, I can speak a little bit about that. Um, I think, you know, one of the things with this film is I thought because, I mean, it is so, you know, the narrative is just so strong and it was received so well. It was very critically like acclaimed. It's a New York Times critics pick. It was a Rolling Stones top 10. We got really, really great reviews and everywhere we showed it, people love, love, love the film. But distribution was really a challenge. It was as if like it couldn't fit in any sort of like box because it's not a film about gun violence. It's not a film about being poor. It's not enough, you know, it, it, it just didn't seem to fit um, any like easy box. So it was, and, and there are no famous people in it. So that was actually quite a challenge that I felt like, oh, this is gonna be a breeze. Everyone loves the film. It's gonna, like, we're gonna be fight beating off like, you know, like offers or whatever. And that didn't happen like at all. <laughs> so. Julie, with your film making, with AARP making it, does it, um, this has to be the last question, sorry, but does, um, do you have your own built-in distribution with that or you, you're still looking for external distribution as well? Okay, just yeah, We are just on the start of our journey right yeah. now. I mean, we, our world premiere was at Heartland on October 21st. Um, uh, then we were at Austin and Chicago last weekend. Now we're in New York next week. I mean, you know, this week. Um, but as far as distribution, no, we're hoping to go wide in 2019, but there's no plans. I mean, nothing yet, so. Well, I want to thank you all for, for making these extraordinary movies about these not ordinary subjects, but um, thank you so much. And we hope you'll all go and see their films. Thanks. <laughs>